Alright, welcome to the next video in our lecture series on philosophy of law and justice. And today we're going to be going over Murray Bookchin's text, Social Ecology and Communalism. And we're going to be putting in conversation with the last text we read in defense of anarchism and then the direction that we're going after this, environmental justice. So, here is a picture of Murray Bookchin, so you can see why I'm wearing a, a beret out of solidarity. Uh, Bookchin's famous text is called The uh, Ecology of Freedom, and he uh, also wrote various texts on uh, anarchism, including historical texts like this one on the Spanish anarchists. And then he's influenced much radical ecological thought after, and so you have other books just on his uh, uh, school of thought which is called Social Ecology, that came out afterwards. So we're also going to be listening to um, a record, The Return of Derrity Column, which is, uh, has a sleeve made out of sandpaper, influenced by the anarchist idea to destroy all other books on the shelves, but in this case, records. So it's a post-punk band from Manchester in the late 70s. Okay, so this book is sectioned into four parts. What is social ecology, radical politics in an era of advanced capitalism, the role of social ecology in a period of reaction, and then the communalist project. So as I said before, the last text we read was Robert Paul Wolf's In Defense of Anarchism. That book uh, looked at this tension between the political authority of the state and personal autonomy. So how does Bookchin's uh, text um, relate to that. Well, what we're going to get from Bookchin is a radical politic that takes into account the ecological crisis. Uh, we're going to get, so we're going to get his politics that way. Um, he used to call himself an anarchist and now he calls himself a communalist. Uh, actually, he died in 2006, so he doesn't call himself anything anymore, but that's the title he took on toward the end of his life. And he became uh, disenchanted with uh, what he called lifestyle anarchism that he thought um, didn't make the right kind of progress. So that's why he's combining his uh, very well-known ideas about social ecology, a sort of radical politics mixed with a radical environmentalism, with uh, anarchist theories now called uh, communalism. So... Uh, to understand the bit about social ecology, which is the first part, uh, we need to understand what Bookchin thinks about uh, metaphysics regarding humans and nature. And this is a subject that we have, or a topic anyway, that we have talked a lot about in this class uh, way back when we started with Rousseau's Origin of Inequality. So we're looking at um, what are human, what is the, uh, what characterizes the relationship between human beings and the natural environment? And how do we see ourselves uh, in relation to the natural environment? Are we part of nature or are we apart from nature? Um, so let's begin. If you have your uh, text, uh, open it up. And by the way, always on these lecture videos, you should have a pad of paper out and a pen, and you should be taking uh, notes on what we're talking about, just as if we were in class. So uh, the first chapter begins on page 19. The chapter is called, What is Social Ecology? And he gives us his thesis for it right away. First sentence. Social ecology is based on the conviction that nearly all of our present ecological problems originate in deep-seated social problems. So, our ecological problems are rooted in deep-seated social problems. So what we have with the environmental crisis is, in Bookchin's, Bookchin's terms, we have human beings dominating nature. We dominate animals, we hunt or kill, or do other things that put certain animals into extinction. We dominate uh, lands by uh, working them in certain kinds of industrial uh, ways so we get uh, profitable yields. We dominate uh, forests insofar as we cut them down for lumber or, as in the case of the Amazon, to maybe make room for grazing for cows that, you know, works into our animal agricultural industry, industrialized animal agricultural industry. So the, his main thesis is this. The 
Nature of the oppression of humans over nature is really an extension of the oppression of some humans over other humans, right? So in order to understand the ecological crisis and the kind of exploitation that occurs within it, we must first understand our own kind of, our own human sociality and the ways in which the certain kinds of practices that have, uh, that have come about under certain ideologies, most uh, importantly capitalism, have um, created things like hierarchy, exploitation, seeing differences between different kinds of people. So uh, they're the workers and we're the owners. Uh, they're the slaves and we're the masters. They're the women and have no rights, but we are the landowning men and have rights. So uh, how do some of the uh, oppressive tendencies of humans on, over other humans get expressed in the way that human beings dominate nature? And um, so his number one, or maybe one or two uh, foes or enemies is of course capitalism, uh, but then also, um, uh, you know, capitalism is an economic system, but it, it developed hand in hand with a certain kind of uh, democratic liberalism that he critiques as being problematic for tons of reasons, but, but most notably, for it being based on the nation state. And so he's gonna give us his critique of capitalism, he's gonna give us a critique of the nature state, and then he's also down the line going to tell us about his theory of communalism, which is a way of organizing society that doesn't fall prey to some of the pitfalls of uh, capitalism. So um, let's look at um, the second section in the first chapter, Nature and Society. So again, this harks back to one of our original uh, questions in this class and one of the questions that is a thread running through it. What do we think about nature? Back to the beginning with Hobbes and Rousseau, is nature scarce or is it abundant? But another question here, you know, what we were looking at, by the way, with the state of nature is, how does the actual state of ecological uh, nature affect human social relationships within it. So how does ecological nature in some way determine human nature? So one of the things he says is that, uh, this is page 23, when we think about nature, there are a lot of different ways to think about it. And the kind of old school way that he's going to distance himself from is to think about nature as uh, linear. Um, so he prefers instead a nonlinear or organic way of thinking about nature that conceives the natural world, he says on page 23, as a developmental process rather than something that is uh, fixed and stagnant. So if one of the hallmark ideas about nature and the natural world is evolution, and evolution means change, uh, evolution is a process of development, then we have to understand nature as having that essence uh, from you know the get-go and always so um, he does think that humans are a part of nature an extension of nature whereas uh, in other schools of thought particularly religious schools of thought and capitalist schools of thought certain religious schools of thought uh, human beings are seen in contrast to nature so if you think about the story of Genesis uh, God created all the animals and the lands and the waters to serve the interests of human beings, but it was only human beings that were made in God's image. So in the philosophical, so we have a soul, that's what makes us different from nature. In someone like Kant's philosophy, we have reason, that, that's what makes us different from nature. So uh, lots of different philosophies and religious perspectives uh, treat human beings as if they are apart from or apart above nature. Nature's over here, humans are over here. Nature's over here, culture is over here. Nature is over here, civilization is over here. And so we have a bunch of dualisms that seek to underscore the contrast between nature on the one hand and human beings. Bookchin says no to all that. He says no, human beings uh, are a part of nature. And if nature, going with what we just said, is a developmental process, then we have to understand human nature and human beings is also participating in that kind of development. 
So when we ask what human beings are like, uh, where we usually use the term nature to describe that, um, it almost suggests that we have this kind of fixed static nature. But he says instead we have to understand our nature as uh, evolving as well. Um, <clears throat> So, um, not only are, should human beings be seen as being within nature, he says on page 26, first full paragraph in the right-hand column, the truth is that human beings not only belong in nature, they are products of a long natural evolutionary process. So again, we have to see ourselves as being products of nature, not in distinction to nature. So he's got this uh, famous distinction between first and second nature. He introduces first nature, the bottom of 26, the paragraph uh, that begins down at the bottom and finishes on the next page. Um, human beings have always remained rooted. Human beings always remain rooted in their biological evolutionary history, which we may call first nature. But they produce a characteristically human social nature of their own which we may call second nature. So first nature is human beings seeing ourselves as uh, like any other animal that uh, emerged out of various evolutionary processes uh, over longer periods of time. Um, but then we start to do stuff. We make fire, we, make, we, we pick up the rock and start hammering with it, we thereby make it into a technology. And then we build little huts out of uh, uh, mud or limestone, etc. And we develop social practices and then down the line, uh, culture and so forth. So everything that we build, the clothes that we make, the language that we speak, the fires that we make, the tents that we construct, that's what he calls second nature. Uh, but second nature is a part of nature. So when we talk about human beings' ability to make certain technologies like the cell phone that I'm using to tape this with, to record this with, um, we shouldn't look at that technology as distinct from nature, but rather as a, 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 a byproduct of a kind of second nature um, from human beings, right? So, um, first and second nature, know that distinction. Another distinction that uh, we need to be mindful of is the distinction, and this again uh, concerns with how we look at ourselves as human beings, the metaphysics of ourselves. Are we a part of nature or are we apart from nature? How do we look at ourselves? How we look at ourselves is going to be determined in part by how we look at the natural world. So there are two ways that we could look at the natural world. The way I was talking about before that is, that, that is held by certain religions or capitalism is to have an anthropocentric view of nature. Nature. Anthro means man or human, center means centered, so a human-centered view of nature. He rejects uh, the human-centered view of nature because anthropocentrism is wrapped up in the ecological crisis. One of the reasons we have gotten to this point of threatening the uh, stability of um, maybe not the earth but at our existence, human existence, and the existence of other animals within the earth, uh, one of the reasons that is at such a dire state is because we've been uh, engaged in all these uh, practices over the last 150 years, but maybe even before that, that are human-centered, that we put uh, human needs over ecological needs, and it's not even always all humans, but rather the, the elites, the aristocrats, the people who uh, have the most power, influence, money, the people who own the means of production. And so that's been really problematic. So he says we should reject anthropocentrism, and he instead favors biocentrism. And biocentrism puts the biotic community or the natural world at the center of our perspective uh, of the world. And so he says this, this, this dualism between biocentrism and anthropocentrism um, unfolds kind of hand in hand with the way human beings have tried to separate themselves out of nature, devalue nature, and then have a, an aggrandized sense of self-value in the place of uh, nature. <clears throat> so, um, 
Social ecology then is based on a view of nature that looks at human beings within nature, that looks at, at nature as this long running process that's subject to change and therefore if we want to understand it, we have to have the right kind of framework, conceptual frameworks to understand it that accommodate the kind of change that, it, that, uh, that uh, it carries with it. And that social ecology is also, uh, also carries the perspective of biocentrism rather than anthropocentrism. He says on page 29, second full paragraph, social ecology calls upon us to see that the natural world and the social are interlinked by evolution into one another that consists of two differentiations, first or biotic nature and second or social nature. So our social nature as an extension of our uh, natural nature or our first nature. Um, so one of the things that differentiates the way our second nature, our social nature, uh, develops, uh, he says on page 30, he says, um, human societies are bonded together by institutions that change radically over centuries. Um, so that's one thing that comes out of our second nature. I mean, tons of things do. Uh, culture, social practices, laws, but that all these things are held together, are bonded together by, con by institutions. An example of an institution would be the constitution of a given community. Um, all right, so the important thing from that section is to know this distinction between first and second nature, anthropocentrism and biocentrism. Looking then at the next section, social, uh, social hierarchy and domination. This section begins with a question. How did the social emerge from the biological? How did second nature emerge from uh, first nature? Um, well, a number of things um, explain this. Um, so, he says um, um, that originally the first communities were non-hierarchical. So that's going to be a major foil in Bookchin's thought, the rejection of hierarchy. And so, um, thinking back to Hobbes, who says that because nature is scarce, human beings are competitive, they'll kill one another because there are limited resources that not everybody can have, so they compete, and life is nasty, brutish, and short. So from that, from Hobbes' perspective, we get this idea that human nature is essentially competitive and, and warlike. And we might also, uh, and you can see how that people who are capitalists like that idea because capitalism is about competition. And so if we get a view of human beings as being naturally competitive, then we you know, could justify an ac economic system that is based on that sense of, sense of uh, competition. But maybe it's not the case that human beings are naturally competitive, but rather, like Rousseau said, uh, cooperative. So, because people nevertheless do think that um, we are competitive by nature, they might also think that we are hierarchical by nature. But he says, no, hierarchy and social domination is something that um, we're not in the first communities, but rather emerged over time. So um, he says that originally the first communities had, this is on page 32, uh, customs, just things that they did. Then uh, religion worked itself into it and morality emerged and kind of replaced customs. And morality was a way of living according to the rule of God. But then eventually, especially with the Greeks, ethics emerged. And ethics was based on rational discourse and reflection. So he said in the beginning, there were, in these first communities, there were these complementary relationships. He talks about this on page 33, first full paragraph. Uh, there is no reason to doubt that these first communities that were organized on bio around biological facts like kinship, age, and gender groups existed initially in complementary relationships. Um, no one really dominated one another. Uh, social organization, social life was based around uh, need and availability. 
but then the first kind of hierarchy uh, emerged in um, generotocracy. I'm not used to saying that word, so apologize if I pronounced it incorrectly. But it's basically about uh, how the elders in society have uh, the power. And this was uh, uh, thought because the elders were thought to be wise and had more experience um, and so on and so forth. But eventually, patriotricity, a kind of early form of patriarchy, uh, in which masculine values and institutions and forms of behavior prevail, that eventually uh, uh, replaced uh, the elder rule. Uh, and then it finally gave, away, gave way to a more coercive form of uh, patriarchy. The point he's making here in kind of tracing this history is to show that it's not a given that hierarchy has to exist in social relationships, that it happened to emerge that way for a number of different reasons, but it didn't have to emerge that way. So what he's saying is that there is precedent for human social organization in a type of political living that does not have a hierarchy to it. Um, so why did hierarchy develop? Well, you mean, that's what he's doing in this section, given a history of 35 to 36, he says, the causes of the emergence of hierarchy are transparent enough. The infirmities of age, increasing population numbers, natural disasters, technological changes that privileged activities of hunting over farming, um, and so on and so forth. So, Quoting a previous book of his on page 36, the book that I held up earlier, Ecology of Freedom, he points to the role of institutions in basically codifying the nature of hierarchy within our social relationships. The point, again, that he wants to get across is we think from our 21st century perspective that, that life has to be organized around hierarchy and where you are on the ladder and this person has more and they have less and the rich and poor and the haves and have-nots and the owners and the workers we just take it as a given that that's the way life has to be but he says no open up a history book or an anthropology book and we'll get all these kinds of um precedents for alternative styles of living now um on page 37 some really interesting ideas Three aspects of non-hierarchical communities that he highlights. Um, and they're actually quite useful for us today. So first column, 37, or 37. Number one, of primary importance among early customs was the principle of irreducible minimum. The shared notion that all members of the same community are entitled to the means of life irrespective of the amount of work they perform, an irreducible minimum. Kind of like, but, but uh, far better than a minimum wage, even better than a minimum living wage, because even a minimum living wage says you have to work. This is more, if something most recent that this is similar to would be something like Andrew Yang's universal basic income. Um, so an irreducible minimum uh, that you have a right to the means of life, to food, shelter, health care. Um, so that's interesting. The second idea is the principle of usufruct. That's a German word, so usufruct, so hopefully I'm saying that correctly. The notion that the means of life that were not being used by one group could be used as needed by another. Something like unused land or orchards and even tools and weapons, if left idle, could be used by anybody else. Lastly, this custom of non, these customs of non-hierarchical societies foster the practice of mutual aid, the rather sensible cooperative sharing of things and labor so that an individual or family in uh, trying circumstances could expect to be helped by others. So the irreducible minimum, usufruct, and mutual aid as three principles or guiding values of non-hierarchical society that we would do well to uh, learn from. Um, especially, I think, the irreducible minimum. So part of the irreducible minimum, to bring it to contemporary terms, would be like uh, universal health care, a minimum, right? Uh, a right to housing, 
a right to uh, dignified labor. But here the point is you don't even have to work necessarily uh, to get the minimum. Um, no, uh, that could be problematic because what about lazy people who don't want to work? Eh, we'll push that to another day. All right, let's move on to the next section, uh, the idea of dominating nature. So one of the things that he, Bookchin, thinks is inherent in capitalism is this metaphysics that puts nature down here and human beings above it. And so uh, we get permission, in a sense, to dominate nature. Um, so, uh, he says at the bottom of 38, we must emphasize here that the idea of dominating nature has its primary source in the domination of human by human and in the structuring of the natural world into a hierarchical chain of being. So that, uh, hits back on that first point when I give you a definition of social ecology that he thinks that the human domination of nature is really rooted in the human domination of other human beings. And the hierarchy that human beings create among themselves is then imported into nature. So we, we see, we attempt to import social hierarchy into the natural world, and we call it something like the food chain. And then we think it's okay to put ourselves at the top of that hierarchy and dominate nature. But it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We basically fabricate or manufacture the notion that hierarchy is natural in order to then justify the hierarchy that we have in society. It's a very cyclical kind of uh, uh, circular kind of thinking. Um, so, uh, he goes into more kind of history ab about that, uh, about how that, um, came about. So let's move to then the next section. Uh, it's called Grow or Die. And this section is very much indicative of what Bookchin thinks, uh, the hallmark and the spirit of capitalism is about. Grow or die. Uh, grow meaning make money, make profit, or perish. Right, so the idea in capitalist business or whatever is that businesses always have to be increasing their profits. It's not anything based on need, but rather based on want. But not even really want. It's based on greed and avarice and hubris. He instead, and we'll return to this idea when he gives us his theory of communalism, thinks that society should be based not on careless, frivolous, and excessive want, greed, but rather based on need and what allows human beings to flourish. So in this section, he gives us um, a bit of a history about how this idea of endless growth and profit worked itself uh, into capitalism and what kind of, of things uh, were sacrificed. So um, the forest only has value to the extent that we cut it down and turn it into lumber, turn it into uh, paper and houses, etc., etc. If we just look at a forest by itself, there's a kind of wastefulness to it. So we have to grow it, meaning use it as resources. And um, but again, not simply to create needs, to create profit and want, excessive desire. Um, so, life is not based around the principles of a kind of flourish-based survival, but, you know, greed, but not for, not that would be available to everybody, but only for the people that are at the top of the hierarchy. Um, so, we've got this idea summed up in maxims like business is business, it's just business, the point of a business is to make money. I'm running a business here. All of that in, in business is sort of, you know, he's treated as kind of synonymous with the spirit of capitalism, uh, capitalist business, that is. Um, the reason he's highlighting all this is to underscore what role capitalist business has in dominating nature and then down the line creating the ecological crisis. And he's also laying the groundwork here to ask this question. If capitalism and even liberal democracy, since they are wrapped up with one another, 
if they played such a role, a tremendous role, in creating the ecological crisis, not just the ecological crisis, but the social crisis of exploitation, hierarchy, lack of food, lack of shell, all the social problems that we have, can those problems really be fixed from within a capitalist or liberal democratic framework? Can they be reformed and fixed, or do we need to tear the system down and really call for not reformist change, but revolutionary change? Of course he's going to advocate for the latter. He's a revolutionary. You saw his hat. These hats are not worn by reformists. They're worn by revolutionaries. So, the next section. Ecolo uh, an ecological society. So what he's calling for, he says at the beginning of this section, social ecology is an appeal not only for moral regeneration, but, and above all else, social reconstruction along ecological lines. So, we as human beings can read nature, can look into nature, and give it a kind of authority that we can get some prescriptive normativity from nature, like Rousseau wondered, uh, but it's not so much the way Rousseau thought about it. Remember, he was like, is there any, legitimate ba is there any basis for legitimate political authority in nature? And he said, no. But what there are principles of in nature uh, are things like symbiosis. You know, we're taught about nature that you know, nature is about survival and reproduction. Only the fittest survive, competition to survive. So we get a very Hobbesian view of Darwinism. But if you read The Origin of Species, the, the book by Darwin, what you'll find is that uh, there are as many, if not more, instances of different parts of nature working cooperatively, which Bookchin calls symbiosis, the kind of cooperative, mutually beneficial, reciprocal, relationships that exist in nature. Those are the kinds of things that we as human beings can look at in nature and hopefully model our social society around. So we can, re we can model second nature around first nature if we're wise enough to look at the principles that underlie first nature, extract them, extrapolate them, and then work them into the way we um, organize society. So he says on page 46, we're seeking to eliminate the hierarchical and class edifices that have imposed themselves on humanity and define the relationships between non-human and human nature. Um, social ecology will advance an ethics of complementary rather than com complementariness rather than competition, cooperativeness rather than fierce competition. What we want to do then is create the kinds of social institutions that weave this natural normativity into it that make human beings conscious ethical agents in promoting the well-being of themselves and the natural world. And the reason why we need to promote the interests of the natural world is because um, the natural world and the interests of the natural world and our interests are in some instances just wrapped up with one another. So it's good for the natural world is good for us. Um, but then on the other hand, the natural world has a value by itself, intrinsic value or inherent worth. And we need to be sensitive, even if, you know, something like a swamp or a bog, we don't really necessarily get much use from a swamp, but the amphibians and other animals that live in that swamp, they get use from it. And Therefore, it has a value in being a biotic community uh, for them. Um, <clears throat> so, we want to you know, rethink nature and rethink our place in it. Eventually, we're going to have to have a kind of politics that emerge from this. Now, and this is going to connect to uh, um, the last chapter in this. In the last few pages of this section, 47, 48, uh, he drops some foreshadowing of the political aspects of communalism that he'll get to in the last section. So 
Uh, he's going to advocate for uh, the formation of a federation of small-scale communities at the level of city that are going to be based on uh, direct democracy and a different set of values. And he's not going to advocate for anything that is uh, anti-technological per se, but rather for a set of values that can govern the development of technology. So, page 51, this middle paragraph is worth reading, uh, the whole thing. Alternatively, a truly ecological society would open the vista of a free nature with a sophisticated eco-technology based on solar, wind, and water. Carefully treated fossil fuels would be cited to produce power to meet rationally conceived needs. Production would occur entirely for use, not for profit and the distribution of goods would occur entirely to meet human needs based on norms established by citizens' assemblies and confederations of assemblies. Decisions by the community would be made according to direct, face-to-face -face procedures with all the coordinative judgments mandated delegates. These judgments, in turn, would be referred back for discussion, approval, modification, or rejection by the assembly of assemblies, or commune of communes, as a whole, reflecting the wishes of the fully assembled majority. So, thinking down the line, where he's going with this is to advocate for uh, communalism, which is going to work in all of these features that he just mentioned. So think about a, a bunch of cities in a kind of federation. Um, so the federation would be the commune of communes, the assembly of assemblies. In our, it's like the United States versus Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania. But in his theory, there would be no United States. There wouldn't really even be Pennsylvania. There would be Pittsburgh, Philly, Scranton, Erie. And we'd be in a feder uh, federation, but we'd largely be autonomous to do what we want. Um, according to the different people that live in these uh, communities. Okay, the next section, Radical Politics in the Era of Advanced Capitalism. Probably the middle two sections um, are the sections that we'll read less closely than the other ones because they're more historical. It's more about Bookchin kind of justifying his philosophical, political, environmental, ecological chops and uh, highlight how this fits into Marxism and socialism um, and so on and so forth. So, um, we got largely the program of what this project is about even from the first chapter. So, the, these middle two sections and then the last section, the, last, the next three sections then are really um, expansions of what we just went over. So, in the second uh, chapter, it gives more of a critique of capitalism, uh, reminding us again how it is based on this kind of grow-or-die uh, mentality uh, and how much ecological devastation it has caused. Um, and so he says, um, one of the things that differentiates communalism, uh, and by the way, again, communalism is his kind of anarchism that he thinks uh, helps solve the problems of anarchist theories, and kind of ties with it Marxist uh, uh, philosophy as well. So in Marxism, you know, communism, what you have is um, you have a state, but it's run by the proletariats or the workers. And um, so the reason why he wants to not continue that line of thinking is because um, Marxism is basically too much wrapped up with the politics of the early 19th, late 18th century, uh, that is industrialization. And now we're living in a kind of different technological time that requires uh, a different kind of analysis. So he says, whereas the locus of the proletarian was, the proletariat was the factory, the locus of what he's talking about, the community, is in fact the community. The locus of the ecological movement would be the community, the neighborhood, the town, the municipality, the city. And again, this is kind of like old school ancient Greek kind of politics because the politics of that day was based on the polis. The politics was based on the polis. The polis was the city-state, the city. 
Athens, um, Sparta, right? So for Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, they were Athenians before they were Greeks. So, so think about that. We are like, I'm an American, but how often do you identify as a, a slippery rocker or a, 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 a yinzer if you're from Pittsburgh or whatever? Um, so what would it mean then to put your city first before your state or your nation? And it kind of makes sense to do so anyway because don't you aren't you more familiar with your city? You live in a city, you know your neighborhood, you've seen your neighbors, you know what's around your neighborhood. So he thinks it makes sense and it's sort of just intuitive that our first association should be with um, our neighborhoods and cities. So um, he gives us kind of... Um, a history of what you know politics is supposed to be. So the next section, the rise of the public domain. Um, so public space, what is the idea of public space, right? Um, it was considered, developed throughout history, different ways of thinking about it in different cultures, different societies, page 60, he says, for the Greek democracies, it was the agora, the, the, the center of the town. It was called the forum in the Roman Republic, the town center in the medieval commune, and the plaza in the Renaissance city. Maybe we call it downtown or the city square or whatever. But it's basically a space in which free and equal citizens could go into and engage one another in public dialogue. You could um be like socrates and have an argument with people about the nature of beauty or justice or whatever you could stand on your soapbox and advocate for a political position um it's not just the town square uh, center it's things like cafes and bars and salons and the beauty parlor and the barber shop and the library and restaurants and public parks these were the public space, right? The, 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 the shared space in which free and equal citizens could enter and engage with one another. Um, um, <clears throat> so he wants to advocate for um, thinking about public, not at the big nation level, not at the state level, but at the level of municipalities, the level of, level of neighborhoods and towns. And because we're more ingratiated and familiar, we have, we're going to have a more natural sense of engagement uh, with those things. But the kind of unity in communities that are, that are different from your community will arise with this idea of federation or confederation. He says on page 64, um, b before I read about confederation, it's important to underscore his his point that he really underlines that the reason why all these ideas seem so radical to us is because we are operating at a point in history in which we it, it is so much hammered into our heads that the country is the state that the nation is the state he says on page 63 politics is always identified completely with statecraft so the notion of even thinking about the society you live in at the level of city is so anathema to us that we really have to use our social imagination to think of it as a viable possibility. So that's one thing to just note, that we just think that, that uh, society is the state or the nation, but we should think instead more locally, right? And remember, when we say the state or the nation, that's the kind of the government that people are often criti critical of on all sides of the aisle. When we think about the government as a bureaucracy, when we think of it as this big faceless thing um, that is maybe slow moving right now uh, during the corona crisis, um, what kind of uh, different policies could be put in place right now that might move more quickly if we weren't entangled by the big apparatus in, of the state and all its m slow moving mechanisms. Um, but on the other hand, um, we get a lot of resources from the nation, the, the, the state, the federal government. So how can we hang on to local autonomy, which is what we want, 
at the at the center of cities, at the level of cities, but then also observe unity, common problems, common solutions, solidarity among different communities. So we will have a community of communities, but it won't be the state or the nation. It will be the confederation. So he says on 64, confederation based on, this is the bottom of 64, last sentence, confederation based on shared responsibilities, full accountability of confederal delegates to their communities, the right to recall, right, to change our minds, and firmly mandated representative forms in uh, 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 firmly mandative, firmly mandated representative forms an indispensable part of new politics. Sorry, I read that poorly. But basically, those were the three ideas. I held up my four fingers, but I meant to just highlight three. Um, full accountability, shared responsibilities, full accountability, and the right to recall. Um, so, the next section in this chapter, the need for new politics. Yeah, that was a short section. Okay, uh, moving on to the third chapter, the role of social ecology in a period of reaction. This chapter really uh, gives us a kind of history of radical movements. So I might uh, run through it a little more quickly because we're already at the 40 minute mark in our lecture and I wanna try to keep them under an hour. Um, now that was shorter than I thought. All right, let's just get into what he thinks the solution is. The solution, from Bookchin's perspective, is communalism. Let me say again that communalism is his form of uh, anarchist theory. And yes, we will be connecting Robert Paul Wolf's concerns into our discussion of this last chapter. Uh, but he rejected, he didn't want to get bogged down with some of the kind of BS cultural problems with anarchism, so he chose a new name, uh, communalism. It's not communism. It's not communitarianism, which is a different movement in philosophy. It's communalism. So we get um, a good definition of communalism um, after he kind of goes back through Marxism, anarch anarchism, a kind of history of why he's not going with those movements. Um, remember, Marxism is too much ingrained in the politics of the, in the industrial and in the politics of industrialized society anarchism is good but um you know the, the problem with anarchism is what um it can be seen in what we've gone over with robert paul wolf and this um this high bar of unanimous direct democracy um that's really hard to meet um, in the way um, it might obstruct individual autonomy. See the last video for the, um, the discussion on that. So um, we need something different that will avoid uh, these problems. We need a different kind of politics. Um, so the discussion of communalism starts on 97. So he says... His thesis, 97. Communalism is the overarching political category most suitable to encompass the fully thought out and systematic views of social ecology, including libertarian municipalism and dialectical naturalism. Um, so how is communalism different from um, anarchism? Um, well, let me just say how it's similar to Marxism. He says, top of 98, from Marxism, communalism draws the basic project of formulating a rational, systematic, and coherent socialism that integrates philosophy, history, economics, and politics. Um, from anarchism, it draws its commitment to anti-statism and confederalism, its commitment to being anti-state, but it's also its commitment to a confederation of communities, as well as its recognition that hierarchy is a basic problem that can be overcome only by a libertarian socialist society. 
So communalism tries to avoid the hyper um, anti-rationalism and hyper individualism of anarchism and the authoritarianism of communism. And because again, in communism, you do have this big massive state that owns everything. It's just that the workers run the state. But Bookchin doesn't like that. He doesn't like states because they're too big. And when you have stuff, a system that is that big at that level, then you're gonna have um, hierarchy will just naturally work itself out. With, within that state system, but we're better, we're better positioned to avoid hierarchy when we structure our society at the level of cities and municipalities rather than, um, rather than the state. So, communalism, page 99, conceptualizes the municipality as a transformative development beyond organic evolution into the domain of social evolution. The city is the domain where the archaic blood tie that was once limited to the unification of families and tribes uh, was dissolved. All right, so what we want is a connection to communities, but what we had in the past was a connection to land. So think about the motherland or the Fazerland, um, which is what Hitler made use of to try to drum up sentiments around blood ties um, so one of the things that was an interesting um, distinction was the distinction between humanity and folk. And when you value humanity, you value all human beings. But when you value folk, you're really only talking about your folk, your people, your bloodline. So what we want is a sense of community based on shared humanity, not community based on blood. Because then, if you don't look like me, or if you don't share a bloodline... Um, I don't necessarily recognize your humanity. So we treat everybody as free and equal citizens engaged in a communal kind of politics. Um, and again, in, in this section in the last, um, you know, pay attention to this discussion of politics, especially the kind of old school politics that emerged uh, in ancient Greece, because what he's using ancient Greece for, ancient Athens, is basically a precedent. We already have direct have had direct democracy. We've already had this uh, city state, direct democracy, city state, and a sense of politics in which everyone was a participant, a citizen. But not only that, you valued your status as citizen and how it allowed you to have full per per political participation. But think about like. Uh, I have to like take off work to go vote or I have jury duty and think about the ways we um, almost bemoan the responsibilities we have as citizens um, uh, like jury duty is such a pain in the ass I mean uh, why you get a chance to um, participate in politics you get a chance to be a judge in a sense uh, you get a chance to uh, engage in citizenship why should we think I mean you know, what kind of background informs that distaste? Probably a background that actually, even though we talk about the value of freedom, do you really think that America values citizenship, like the idea that we should have an engaged politics? Um, or do we tend to value representation and free time more than engaged citizenship? Probably the latter. Page 101, another good quote about communalism. Second sentence, top paragraph. The way, in which, the way in which communalism is influenced by libertarian municipal, municipalism. Communalism resolutely seeks to eliminate the statist municipal structures and replace them with institutions of a libertarian polity. It seeks to radically restructure cities' governing institutions into popular democratic assemblies based on neighborhoods, towns, and villages. And these popular assemblies, citizens, including the middle class as well as the working classes, deal with community affairs on a face-to-face -face basis, making policy decisions in a direct democracy and giving reality to the ideal of humanistic, rational society. You know, when he talks about rational society, he's saying, let's allow for change in society, but instead of changing under the conditions of endless growth, 
that reinforce hierarchy, exploit people, and create wealth for only people at the top, we should allow changes in society to unfold based on true human need, what's best for the community, and enlightened rational communal interest. Um, so that's communalism and its philosophy of libertarian municipalism. And then he talks about thinking about citizenship in a different way. Page 104, top. But as citizens, where our overriding concern should be the general interest of the society in which we lived, the general interest, what Rousseau called the common good, Citizens should be freed of their particular, particularist identity as workers, specialists, and individuals concerned with their own interests, and instead municipal life, politics that we want, should become a school for the formation of citizens, both by absorbing new citizens and by educating the young, while the assemblies themselves should function not only as permanent decision-making institutions, but as arenas for educating the people and handling complex civic regional affairs. You know, probably a lot of what Bookchin is talking about seems so radical, but the, the thing to think about is why it seems so new in EU, it's this band we're listening to now, German band, Neue, which means new in German, why it seems so new and radical. It only seems new and radical to us because of our starting position. Our starting position being 21st century corporate capitalism in which we're used to seeing people exploited, we're used to seeing relationships governed by uh, chains of command and hierarchy, and so we end up thinking that they're just natural. But we need to be thinking about citizenship in a more radical, revolutionary way, Bookchin says, um, in terms of not simply what is best for ourselves as a collection of individuals, but what is best for ourselves as a com community of individuals, where we have a common shared good based on uh, and needs and enlightened um, values. Um, so that about brings us to the end of the book. Um, so if you have questions, I want you to put them in the comments on YouTube while this will go. So to sum up, okay, yeah, so there was, a, okay, so by the way, where did he mention it? The question of direct democracy and you... Unanimous direct democracy did come up, but now I'm having trouble figuring out where it came up. But basically, um, Bookchin would not require the bar of unanimous direct democracy. Um, he thinks that a majority rule within the context of communalism would suffice. This is not a majority rule within the context of capitalism, but within the context of communalism. The difference being that within the context of communalism, you already have these preceding values, anti-hierarchy, anti-exploitation, uh, the development of society uh, based on human needs and uh, reason, not greed, and so forth, um, and um, the shared direct democratic principles. So. Um, so he thinks that would be sufficient to get us where we need to go. And within that context, um, people, you know, uh, living in a communalism is not always getting every single thing that you want. That's a high bar that will never be met when we're living around different people uh, in which, although we have some shared wants and needs, we don't necessarily have all shared uh, wants. But we do have basically all shared needs, more or less. Um, so he thinks that majority rule based on direct, direct democracy within communalism will uh, suffice. Um, and that kind of hyper autonomy that Wolf advocated, that's an example of uh, the kind of like unenlightened anarchism that he wanted to separate himself from in the latter years of his life. So what I want you to know from Bookchin the book is what is social ecology? What is social ecology? 
what is the different metaphysics regarding human and nature that it carries with it, what is communalism as a political theory, how it is different from capitalism, Marxism, and anarchism, and what, uh, you know, a bit about how it would work, um, uh, and you get that in the last section. So, we're seeing then a continuation of thought in this class. What we got here was the kind of society that we actually do want to form if we were to ever leave the state of nature that is based on different kinds of radical principles, not on the basic, more or less, liberalism of Rawls. Um, so what we also got from this text was a kind of working in uh, ideas about nature um, and that nature needs to be a primary concern because we are a part of nature, not apart from nature. So looking to next week with the book, um, uh, I forgot what the book is called, but it's the text on uh, environmental justice, Schlossberg. Um, by the way, I just ordered my copy today, so I'll be scanning a copy and making it available to y'all as soon as I get it. Um, but the way in which that text, this text, is going to bridge to that text is, is, in, is in terms of its uh, emphasis on uh, the natural environment. Um, and then the kind of eco-sovereignty that we're going to get in the last text with the boar is about the kind of sovereignty that these kinds of small-scale communities in a federation of communities uh, would need sovereignty over their land and so forth. So we're really going to see some connections to the next uh, two texts that we're reading. So hope everybody is doing well. Again, if you have questions, ask them on YouTube. Might be easier if you subscribe uh, to the channel. No big deal. Um, and I hope everybody is staying healthy and uh, not too many people have been emailing me about class so you don't necessarily need to just make sure you keep it up with these discussions and definitely watching these videos and taking notes on them so I will see you uh, next week vis-a-vis uh, -vis the video um, alright then